So you're sitting on trial, you're accused of being an atheist, and destroying the minds of the youth. The country you once served, it's turned its back on you. And the court expects you to cower in fear as you plead for your innocence. You calmly sip a little coffee, and you let them know, I will not alter my ways even if I have to die many times. You see, the truth will set you free, but sometimes that freedom is death. Let's go meet Socrates. It's a wonderful world. Hello everyone, welcome to The Cause. My name is Rob, and today we're going to be diving back into history. Like 2,400 years ago, we're going to be discussing the first book in the second volume of the Harvard Classic series, The Apology by Plato. It's an amazing book. It's one of these, we're finally getting to the books that like I'm just, I'm excited about. You know, I'm excited to dive into these. It's going to be a fun conversation. Uh, really looking forward to it. I'm also putting these out on podcast now, so if you'd rather just listen to it on any podcast platform, um, you can just type in my name, Rob Peary, The Cause, and it should come up. Uh, I also have a coffee podcast, so you'll probably see that one first. So anyway, just make your way through there. You'll find it. I have faith in you. So first of all, we're going to discuss how the book is set up and a little bit of the background and stuff like that. Then we're going to dive into the story of it. And afterwards, we're going to follow it up with some key takeaways and examine a life worth living. So real quick, set up in the background. The Apology is the second book in Plato's Five Dialogues. Eliot would not include Euphiro or Mino in the Harvard Classic series. He only included the Apology, Crito, and Phaedo. Now, the Apology is kind of in dialogue form, but it doesn't really seem like it because Socrates is doing so much at the speaking. But Crito and Phaedo definitely will be in that dialogue kind of setting. And then also for these books, you have to realize that Socrates is using this Socratic method of kind of like arguing his case. And it's basically a conversational style or method of determining what is true and just by just asking questions. Now, the hard part is being honest with your answers. And also, by starting with the Apology, we have to realize who Socrates was. Now, Plato wrote the Apology, but Socrates is the main character. Now, Plato was there in court. Socrates actually calls him out, you know, as one of the people um, being there in the court when he was on trial. And Apology or apologia in Latin, which when it translates to Greek, means like speaking in defense of, which kind of threw me off because whenever I first, you know, read the title Apology, I'm thinking that Socrates is going to be apologizing for the things he did. And as you'll see when we, as we go through the video, Socrates does not apologize. So again, Socrates is on trial for corrupting the youth and being an atheist, and also like not believing in the gods of the state. The three accusers of his trial is Miletus on behalf of the poets, Anitus on behalf of the craftsmen, and Lycan on behalf of the rhetoricians. So moved into the story. Uh, the first line of the book is amazing, and it kind of opens up with Socrates' character. I'll read it to you real quick. How have you felt, O men of Athens, at hearing the speeches of my accusers, I cannot tell, but I know that their persuasive words almost made me forget who I was. Such was the effect of them, and yet they have hardly spoken a word of truth. I mean, Socrates comes out right off the bat with the sarcasm, and I love it because it kind of sets up the rest of his trial. It's his bogus trial. Well, let's just get into it. I'm getting a little ahead. Let me, let me get into it. So again, Socrates is on trial for corrupting the youth. But there's some irony here because Socrates' opening argument to his accusers is that they've kind of already been corrupted. He says, But far more dangerous are these who began when you were children and took possessions of your minds with their falsehoods. He says, Their charges against me are ancient date, and they made them in days when you were impressible, in childhood, or perhaps youth. And the cause, when heard, went by default, for there's no one to answer. So it appears that the people putting Socrates on trial have been corrupting the youth against him as well. But what does that really mean to corrupt the youth? Who determines the correct way for the youth to be educated? Is it the state? Is it the parents? Society? We know by reading Plato's Republic what he thinks. But who's in control of it? These are questions Socrates will go through during the trial. And Socrates doesn't claim to be a teacher or anything like that because he doesn't take any money, he doesn't have any like classes or anything like that. It's just people that come up and want to hear what he has to say. So the people then wonder like, where did all the accusations come from? And so then Socrates explains that his friend Chirophon went to Delphi and asked an oracle who the wisest 
man was. Now, the oracle said that Socrates was the wisest man, and Socrates is kind of taken back. He asks, how could I be the wisest man? He doesn't feel any wiser than any, anybody else, and he kind of questions its truthfulness. So after, you know, kind of seeking out the wisest people that he can find, poets, businessmen, politicians, uh, he kind of steps back and realizes, like, yeah, these these individuals in these high positions they're not really too wise and it kind of made me think like have you ever worked at a place and then you work there for a while and then finally you meet like the higher ups and like the upper level management and you're sitting there and you're thinking like how is this ship even sailing you know i mean it's pretty bad up there and during this process of going through and basically questioning and finding out who wasn't that wise socrates kind of makes some enemies you know he says they led him to have many enemies of the most worst and dangerous kind uh, socrates says but the truth is only god is wise so even at this point he doesn't think he is wise he's saying only god is really wise and then he says something that i almost missed whenever i first read it the first time so i'll, I'll I'll read it here. I think it's a pretty important uh, statement. He says, The wisdom of a man is little or nothing. He is not speaking of Socrates. He is only using my name as an illustration, as if he said, He, O oh men, is the wisest, who, like Socrates, knows that his wisdom is in truth worth knowing. Truth worth knowing. That's, that's a statement right there. All Socrates is doing is just questioning people in what has, you know, become known as the Socratic method. And some younger rich kids with a bunch of free time basically gather around him and they learn this method and then they go and practice it themselves on, you know, the population around them. And by doing this, it kind of further builds animosity towards Socrates because he looks like he's the one that's kind of teaching them to go out and question authority, question the status quo, or, you know, just corrupting the youth by having them ask questions about their environment, thereby peeling back the layers of truth. Truth. And it makes you wonder, like, why do people fear truth? Because behind the truth lies the power, the money, the influence. Socrates says, For they do not confess that their pretense of knowledge has been detected, which is the truth. And as they are numerous and ambitious and energetic, and are all in battle array, and have persuasive tongues, they have filled your ears with their loud and inveterate calumnies. A lot of that still goes on today. And because of that, he says that's why his three accusers are against him. Miletus, Anitus, and Ly Lysen. I don't know if it's Lycon or Lysen. Oh, I've been saying kind of both. I'm pretty sure it's one of them. He then proceeds to explain to the court how none of the accusations make sense. He's only exposing the truth to the youth. Therefore, you can't really corrupt somebody if you're just exposing them to the truth. And then also, he doesn't... He's not an atheist because he believes in a god or the god. He just doesn't believe in a bunch of gods. And at this point, you kind of start to realize that Socrates knows that the accusations, they're not going to make sense. The whole purpose of the trial is to silence Socrates. He goes on to say, A man who is good for anything ought not to calculate the chance of living or dying. He ought only to consider whether in doing anything he is doing right or wrong. Now, this is important because where he's about to push this trial, you'll notice that he is not scared to die. And after this, he solidifies that statement by mentioning three battles he was in. It solidifies the statement above because it shows he loved his country and was willing to die for the people that are sitting up here that he's on trial in front of. And it also goes to show how fast the population will forget your sacrifices. Socrates was in the battles of Potidaea, Amphipolis, and Delium. And at this point, Socrates goes on to apologize by declaring his intentions of truth. And for me, this was probably the most important concept I took away from this book, because this is when I realized it was no longer an apology. I didn't quite understand what apology meant in the Greek term, because this is where the story flips to a firm declaration of truth. And he says here, he says, I should reply, men of Athens, I honor and love you, but I shall obey God rather than you. And while I have life and strength, I shall never cease from the practice and teaching of philosophy, exhorting anyone whom I meet after my manner, and convincing him, saying, O my friend, why do you, who are a citizen of the great and mighty and wise city of Athens, care so much about laying up the greatest amount of money and honor and reputation, and so little about wisdom and truth, and the greatest improvement of the soul, which you never regard or heed at all? Socrates is declaring openly that he's only going to obey God. He goes on to also say, But whatever you do, know that I shall never alter my ways, not even if I have to die many times. I love that statement because it doesn't matter about death. 
You shouldn't be scared about death if it's something that's righteous that you should be doing. There are a few times in life when you get the chance to be unashamedly brave, and this is Socrates' moment. Because when you realize that the decision to be honest and truthful in the face of death, it allows you to die with an honor that not many people in life are giving the opportunity to experience. And Socrates would not be the last one to face something like this. Jesus of Nazareth would go through the same situation a few hundred years later and many people after that. Now, the truth will set you free, but sometimes that freedom, it's through death. And Socrates at this point does not become dramatic or anything like that in court. He's not begging. He's not pleading. And in speaking of people, you know, acting up in court with sadness and drama and all that, he says, they seemed to fancy that they were going to suffer something dreadful if they died and that they could be immortal if you only allow them to live. Now, at this point, Socrates also realizes too that by not begging and pleading, is going to offend everybody at the court. And does Socrates care? Not one damn bit. So at this point, the court finds Socrates guilty, and Miletus, he requests the death penalty. Now, Socrates does not seem bothered at all by this, and he'll go through kind of like this series of arguments of like lesser punishments, but then he's like, nah, it don't really matter because it, I'm still going to be a philosopher and speak out against it anyway. So, yeah, I guess death is probably the best way to go about this. So he's not going to cave to the mob. And somebody asked, like, if he could go to another town and just kind of shut his mouth and live out the rest of his days. And he says, no, I have a great difficulty in making you understand my answer to this. For I tell you that this would be a disobedience to a divine command and therefore that I cannot hold my tongue. Now, this kind of brings me back almost into um, like the, the Hebrew teachings of the Abraham, you know, Moses kind of statement. And then oftentimes I've wondered, and I've, I've heard other scholars kind of talk about it, that maybe Socrates and, you know, the philosophers during that time period had read into the Hebrew text of, of Abraham and stuff like that. And maybe some of that was starting to bleed over into that one God mindset. But I like the concept of the divine command because I'm, I wonder who is that divine command? Is it, you know, his singular God? Where is that coming from? And he listens to it throughout his life, it seems, if you read through some of the other books in the dialogues. He also goes on to say around this point that a life that is unexamined is not worth living. And with that being said, I'll, I'll read this one real quick. He says, But I had not the boldness or impudence or inclination to address you as you would have liked me to address you, weeping and wailing and lamenting, and saying and doing many things which you have been accustomed to hear from others, and which, as I say, are unworthy of me. But I thought that I ought not to do anything common or mean in the hour of danger, nor do I now repent of the manner of my defense. And I would rather die having spoken after my manner then speak in the manner and live. He already knows at this point that he's going to get the death penalty. I don't think there's any questioning that at this point. And everything now is just upholding that that honorable place that he's kind of established, that, that baseline that he's created in his life. To back down now, it cancels out everything he's ever done. Moving into the last page, the last chapter, the last sentence of the of the book, it really just wraps it up. And if it doesn't give you goosebumps after you finish this section and you read it, man, read it again. He says, The hour of departure has arrived, and we go our ways. I to die, and you to live. Which is better? God only knows. I love that. I got three good quotes. One is, He who will really fight for the right, if he would live, even for a little while, must have a private station and not a public one. Two, the difficulty, my friend, is not avoiding death, but avoiding unrighteousness, for that runs faster than death. And the life which is unexamined is not worth living. I think that's an important one. I think that's almost one you should memorize. So how do we live a life worth examining? After reflecting back on the trial of Socrates, it sadly made me realize we have advanced so far in technology and stuff like that. But we are literally still in the Greek times when it comes to truth, justice, and reason. Silencing is still going on today. Changing the truth to fit a narrative is still occurring. And the concept of justice is in such a fluid state that I can't even really recognize it sometimes. And then there's still the corruption of the youth. So I think about that a lot. We are still intellectually in the days of Socrates as a collective society. And we may possibly be worse off. So is your life worth examining? So with that being asked... I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Trial of Socrates by Plato. If you would like to help support the channel, I roast the devil out of some coffee. So if you feel the need to stay caffeinated while you read through some amazing books, then think about ordering a little bag of coffee. And with that being said, I'll see you all next week. We're going to discuss Crito going to the jail cell of Socrates and trying to bust him out.
So I can't wait to share that one with you. After that, we got Fido. So yeah, we got them lined up. I'm looking forward to it. Truly hope y'all enjoy these. Stay blessed. Drink some amazing coffee, and I will see you next week. Love y'all. Thank y'all so much. Somewhere swimming too far off the beach. Off the coastline in Bermuda, the triangle in the sea. Well, I'd cannonball right out there if I thought it'd change a thing. I came back from Brooklyn, but you didn't come back for me.